Hi everyone and welcome to my talk on the art of wearing multiple hats. I'm Sid and this is my first webinar for the product school. So I would really appreciate any comments or feedback that you have to make the next one better. This talk is mainly targeted at fresh product managers who are just getting started or in the initial phases of their career or for people wondering if product management is right for them and this is what they want to do in their working life. So I'll start with a few disclaimers. Um, the first one is that all of my experience has been in the tech industry and so all of my observations are scoped accordingly. This may not be fully valid for folks in consumer goods or other sectors of the industry. Second, these are all just my thoughts and observations from what I have seen. Don't treat them as facts and I'm happy to get feedback or corrections if you think I'm going wrong somewhere. Um, and lastly, these images are not my own. I've just taken them from web search. So with that, let's jump into the introductions. Um, I'm Sid. I went to UW, that's University of Washington, Seattle for my PhD in wireless communications. During my PhD, I did a program manager internship at Microsoft and just fell in love with the role. Um, I was absolutely convinced that this is what I'm meant to do. And so after I graduated, I went right back to Microsoft for a full-time position in the Windows Phone org. I spent a couple of years there and worked on some innovative features in Wi-Fi as well as Bluetooth on Windows Phone. And then we got reorged into the larger Windows organization where I worked on some of the networking APIs as well as a sync platform. After five years at Microsoft, I wanted to try something new and I was really enthusiastic about voice-based smart assistants as a growing sector. And so I interviewed with Alexa and I got a position as a device PM in the Echo Devices group. So our team basically owns all of the Echo devices that we sell and specifically my team owns the ones with screens on them. So that's our Echo Show line. The Echo Show 5 was my first end-to-end -end product as a product manager. I wrote the first concept document of that device and took it all the way from that concept stage to hardware, software, marketing, beta, and all the way to a global launch in 11 countries. So that one is really special to me. Um, and then the next one that I worked on is the Echo Show 10, which if you follow the news, we recently announced that a couple of weeks ago. It's the first ever smart display that has physical motion built into it. So when you talk to it, the screen rotates to face you. It's a super innovative design and I'm really excited to see what customers think about that one. I like to think I'm just getting started. Uh, I'm about nine and a half years now into product management, but I'm sure I'll have many more journeys yet to come. So with that, let's dive right into what defines a product manager. I'm sure those of you who are already a product manager or those aspiring to be one have seen a bunch of websites or attended courses and have a good understanding of what the discipline entails. So I won't spend too much time going into depth on this one, but I'm sure we all understand that the product manager basically sits at the intersection of a, the customer, the business and the engineering or the technology. So to be a good PM, you already have to master these three hats and be really good at voicing the customer, at understanding how your product feeds into the business strategy of the company, and at least learn the basics of the technology on which your product is built. So as you can see, even the basic table stakes for being a product manager requires you to wear these three hats, if you will. But that's not enough. So now the question is, how do I go beyond? How do I go from being a basic product manager to being one of the top ones in my company or in the field? So when I think about what defines the greatest program product managers that I have worked with, a few things come to mind. Number one, 
I think they're known for consistently showing high judgment. In Amazon, we have a leadership principle called I write a lot. What this means is when faced with decisions that you don't have a clear data point or you don't have clear research to guide you, these folks have consistently demonstrated good judgment. Now, obviously they're not born with it. The way they get it is through experience, learning and pattern matching. So as you go through multiple product cycles, you should always keep in mind what are the patterns that you're seeing, learn to match those patterns to similar products or your past products and make good judgment decisions that way. The second one is obviously a track record of successful e execution. Some of this just comes with time in the field, but as you'll see in the future slides, mastering the different hats of product management helps you get to that track record faster and helps you make each execution successful. The next one is building trust with the functional leaders or the teams. So there are some product managers who will execute flawlessly and get the product out on time, but they leave behind a bunch of dead bodies. You, you don't want to be that person. You want to be a product manager that you not only ship your product on time, but the folks that you worked with can't wait to work with you again. And that's really the hallmark of a good product manager. They build trust, they build a good camaraderie within the team, and folks want to work with them again and again. And the last one is becoming the go-to expert for your product. So this one really needs you to understand your product from a 360 degree perspective. Whether it's the UX of your product, the metrics that are important, how it feeds into business strategy, what are related features that are out there, what are competitors doing in that space. All of these aspects you must be super familiar with and make yourself the expert. And this really needs you to immerse yourself into your product and really give it your all to understand it thoroughly and from all angles. And this is a great segue into what I call the hats. So the hats are nothing but all of the different roles that go into making a great product. And as a product manager, the more you can think from all of these different points of view, the stronger you are as a product manager and the better you understand your product overall. Not just that, it also helps you ask the right questions from the right stakeholders to set your team up for success. So clearly, as we discussed in the 101 definition, the customer, engineer, and leader are the three basic hats for product managers. But to be a really successful one, you can't stop there. There are many more hats that you need to wear, such as a UX designer, user research, marketing, privacy, data analysis. There are some that I haven't even listed here, like technical writing, if your product deals with either developers or customer facing documentation, things like that. So obviously there are a bunch of these different points of view and there is not enough time for you to master all of them. So what does it really mean for a product manager to be able to wear these hats? When do I wear which hat? And how do I learn? How do I get started with wearing each of these hats? These are some of the things we'll cover in the talk today. Now in the interest of time, I don't think I can cover all of the roles that product managers might cover. So I'm just gonna focus on the first five. But as you'll see, a lot of the techniques or how to learn them will be valid for all the other roles as well. So with that, let's get started with the most important hat for a product manager, which is the customer. So I know this has been sort of beaten to death and it seems super obvious that, yeah, obviously product managers have to be deeply rooted into the customer's mindset, but it's actually harder than you would imagine. The reason it's harder is you as a product manager already understand your product to a great deal. Your customers do not have the benefit of that context or that knowledge. 
And so sometimes it's really hard to unlearn whatever you know about your product and look at it from a fresh perspective coming to the table with someone who just doesn't know anything in that area. And so I have seen that the best product managers are really good at sort of deleting their knowledge, deleting what context they have and coming at problems from a fresh customer perspective. So let's go through some questions that you should ask yourself when putting yourself in the shoes of a customer. The first one is really understanding what need or pain point you're solving. Now this is different from the task that you have been given or the goal of your feature. And I'll give you an example. So in Windows Phone, we had this feature called Wi-Fi Sense. And the goal of that feature was to automatically connect to Wi-Fi hotspots as people walk around in public places like malls or airports, etc. So the goal of the feature would be defined as connect automatically to Wi-Fi hotspots that are free and available whenever possible. But the underlying pain point or the need that it was addressing is to save money for customers. Because back then, data plans were super expensive and were charged by the byte. And so you wanted to save customers money by latching onto Wi-Fi networks whenever possible. The next question is, whenever you're presenting a product journey or a setup steps, or even like a usage model for a product, always ask if this is the simplest way for customers to achieve the value that's hidden behind. So continuing the Wi-Fi example, we realized pretty quickly like, hey, when I enter the airport, we could just give a toast notification saying, you know, CTAC Wi-Fi is available. Do you want to connect? And customers could just tap on it, go through the connection and connect. That already saves them money because we are prompting them when a good Wi-Fi is available nearby. But that's still not the simplest way because it needs them to get out of the app or whatever they were doing on the phone, go into the Wi-Fi settings, maybe enter their email or accept conditions, enter their name, blah, blah, blah. Seven steps later, they need to switch back to their app. So then we pushed ourselves further and we said, nope, there's got to be an easier way and finally we innovated a method by which we could remember the http message exchange happening between the phone and the wi-fi network from some of the phones gather them in a service and then simply replay them for other people who use that network that way as a customer you just walk into the airport the phone automatically connects to the network and you just get a toast saying hey i connected to ctac wi-fi if you are watching Netflix, you never have to leave the app. You just continue watching your movie. Now, the next question is to understand how any product you're offering is better and worse than the alternatives today. And I emphasize the worse because every product manager naturally thinks that their product is better than competition or better than the way customers are currently doing it. Otherwise, you wouldn't make it. However, there's always some aspect that the current method is better than your product at achieving. And so just being cognizant of that fact, recognizing that helps you mitigate them in the form of maybe ease of setup or setting expectations up front or targeting the right kind of customers for whom your feature actually does make a lot of sense. Then there are some other questions about how, what is the journey for each customer persona. So often you'll target multiple different kinds of customers. For example, in the world of Alexa, we often think of customers who A, already have multiple Alexa devices in their home. B, this is their first purchase. C, they know someone, maybe a family member who has a device and now they are being gifted one. So there are these different personas and often the journey by which they discover devices or they discover features in those devices is often different based on which persona they are. Last but often ignored is how and why your feature is different from a related feature. 
especially as you become part of a larger product <clears throat> like we have the echo device family or in facebook there is news feed so as you introduce new features within a larger umbrella it's really important to dig deep and understand why is it that you are creating a completely new feature in an existing umbrella do customers appreciate the difference between what your feature does versus what this other very related feature does should you perhaps combine them should you <clears throat> create a bridge from the existing feature to your new functionality and so on it's very tempting to start with a clean slate and say hey i'm going to create this awesome new feature we are going to start from a clean slate no baggage but you're just increasing confusion and the available choices for customers and overwhelming them a great example that i learned in alexa was alarms and timers now clearly they seem like two different features but often customers will switch between the two and they'll say something like wake me up in 30 minutes now typically wake me up is an alarm utterance but in 30 minutes is a timer and so we have to constantly decide like hey should we give them the timer experience for that or the alarm experience for that and so just recognizing how customers think of multiple features as interchangeable helps you design them better now the next one after the customer is the engineer view now as i said at the start i am from a tech background and i have been working in the tech industry so you really need to understand how the technology works what are common pitfalls and how to avoid them in your product if you are coming from a non tech background i understand it must be hard for you to get started on this and it may feel overwhelming but trust me your engineers will love the fact that you are trying your best and at least trying to learn some of their craft and even if you don't perfect it it's still super helpful and you are better off than you were previously so don't hesitate just start somewhere and spend time with your engineers and learn some of that now what are some of the common questions that product managers should ask when looking at an engineering design or when considering an engineering architecture approach for the feature the first one is asking if whatever implementation we are doing is scalable and flexible in today's world especially in online products products could scale very fast very soon which is actually the goal right that would that's what success would look like so you need to make sure that whatever implementations you are putting in place can scale efficiently and effectively as well the second one that's often overlooked is differentiating between what are basic capabilities that you need in the product versus what is a policy so i can give you a quick example um let's say in the echo show 10 we were introducing motion so there were some basic capabilities that hey when i see a human i want to be able to turn and things like that whereas there were some policies in how fast do i want to turn at what point do i want to turn and things like that so as a product manager you should be able to differentiate between what is the functionality i need from the engineering team but what is the policy that i'll apply on top and typically the way you should build it is the capabilities are sort of hard built into code whereas policies are more like configurable knobs preferably in the cloud that you can adjust dynamically and you're not locking yourself into a certain cx the next couple of questions deal with reusing existing collateral versus creating new stuff again it's tempting to start a fresh create new components but it's very very useful to look around see what components exist and see if you should reuse them one of the tricky things while reusing engineering components though is checking with that team to make sure that the dependency you are taking is actually supported because sometimes they will evolve that component not knowing that you have taken a dependency on it and then it breaks your scenario so always good to check with the other team when you are taking a dependency the next one is 
sort of a judgment call as well as sort of a pragmatic approach of knowing when you need to do a quick hack to unlock some basic testing or some cross team development when you need a short term fix and when do you need a long term scalable solution sometimes the hack is a right thing to do because it unblocks some other team from working on a downstream feature while the first team works on the right approach or the scalable approach for the first stage so it's not necessarily bad as long as you have a plan to remove that hack and put in the right solution before launch and the last one that i have learned to ask my engineers for every single time is where is the off switch um often you're building features you're building products but due to unforeseen circumstances you may have to roll it back at the last minute you may have to change or switch the policy of the ux at the last minute and so just being cognizant of that fact making sure there is an off switch that cleanly removes the feature from all the different surfaces that it exposes to and things like that is really critical so that's sort of the engineering point of view again if you're not from a tech background and are not comfortable diving deep into all this it's perfectly fine but even having a surface level is super valuable so next we come to the hat of a leader so when you think leader think about your director or vice president or some person like that who has like an overarching view of not just your product or your feature but of the overall product set or the overall company now often as individual product managers you are operating in a bubble and you are operating and trying to stay focused and run fast to the finish line for your individual feature but there are things happening elsewhere in the company that may have implications on how you build and ship your feature so the first question to ask when thinking as a leader is is my product or my vision in sync with what's happening across the org the company or even the larger industry i'll give you an example in windows we had a sync platform that helps you sort of synchronize your settings from one laptop to the other so if you change your wallpaper it quickly changes on all your other laptops as well now one of the features that i was driving is how can we make this super responsive and super fast so it's almost like magic that you favorite a website on one browser you go to your phone it's already in your favorites or you add something to your reading list it's already in your reading list and that was great our ux designers loved that and we were all sort of innovating towards that at the same time though we realized that the cloud infrastructure that supports us which is onedrive had a mandate to reduce their costs of operation for the year and one of the key costs was each transaction being written and read from the cloud and so clearly our goal was just opposed with theirs to save the number of transactions and so we reached out to them and we started sort of a cross team collaboration to understand how we could unlock the user feature while still reducing cost so that's what i mean by being cognizant with what's happening across the org or the company now the next one is what are the alternate approaches to this problem often there is pressure to quickly run and decide what option you are going to pick for a certain product or a feature but it's very important to document what are the other options you consider and why you did not choose them because this often exposes what your assumptions were and it can save you a lot of back and forth in meetings or in leadership reviews to just be upfront saying hey we considered options 1 2 and 3 these were the pros and cons this is why we are going with option 2 and having that in the back of your mind and being open to be challenged is always a good thing the next one is a critical one from a leadership perspective often there are especially in very innovative areas where your feature may be the first of its kind in either your company or even in the industry it's hard to get very specific data 
or even like large scale customer research because you want to keep the feature confidential. However, specific aspects of it are often knowable from past related features or from what we consider proxies. So you want to understand whether people like UX this way or that way, how many people typically have one device versus multiple devices. And these are knowable facts that you should not have to apply judgment or subjective opinions on. So it's very important to draw the line between what's a knowable fact, here is how we'll get that data versus what is truly judgment and opinion and clearly call that out. The next one that I've learned over time and sometimes pretty painfully is that it's always important for all the right teams to be engaged and at the right priority. Often the wrong teams could spend months trying to get something done that the right team could unlock in a few hours even because they have the right expertise, they have the right know-how, they have the right tool set. So when you're starting a product or starting a project, always ask yourself, okay, if I had the control of all of the teams at my company, who would I tap? to make this execution successful and at least present that to your leaders. So you may get some help in enlisting those teams if that is the right priority for the business. Sort of related to that question is this next one of being able to identify what are your top bottlenecks. A project, especially complex projects, typically have multiple failure nodes. So they have multiple places where failure or delays could endanger the overall timeline, but there are often hot spots that you're like, you just know when you look at them that, okay, this is in the critical path. And so de-risking those at the start is very important. And the last one that comes with time and more judgment is differentiating between high impact and low impact decisions. These are often considered in different aspects. So. One aspect could be, is this a reversible or irreversible decision? Whether to put a camera shutter on a device is an irreversible decision. Once you ship the device, there is no way you can add it back. Um, the other axis to think about is whether it's a hardware, a software, or a cloud service decision, because that often determines how easy it is to change or revert it subsequently. There's some other aspects as well of whether this decision is related to customer privacy or is a legal risk and things like that. So knowing which decisions are relatively low impact, you just need to decide one POR, you can quickly test and revert it if it's not the right one versus what decisions you want to make 110% sure are the right ones before going in is really critical for a product manager. So now we have covered the customer, engineer, and leader hats. Next, let's go into UX design. So this one sometimes overlaps with the customer hat in that you want to make sure that the UI that you design or the overall UX is super clear and customer friendly. Again, just like in the customer hat, it's important to know if it works for a person who has no knowledge of the product. And it can be really hard to do that as a product manager of that feature. So don't be afraid to enlist your friends and you know, just reach out to people who don't know what you're working on and say, hey, I just wanted to run this UI by you. There's no right or wrong answers. Just tell me what you would do, what controls you would click, what questions do you have when you look at this as you walk through. And you'll be surprised at how a fresh perspective often uncovers deep insights into the UI that you've presented. The next question is about whether the UX that you are designing is consistent with similar features. Often you'll find products that are large or complex, again, like the Facebook newsfeed or the Windows operating system that have many, many parts to them, where one part is sort of designed in one way and the other part is designed in another and that's often a symptom of different teams designing it or them being designed at different times maybe with different philosophies 
but that's what you want to avoid as a product manager you want to make sure that you recognize what are related features how customers perceive these related features and make sure that the ux is consistent across all of those the next one is to truly put yourself in customer shoes and understand all of the situations that your feature could be used in often there is a temptation to run with the most common path of this is how the feature will be used and you optimize the ux for it and everything is great but what you fail to realize is there is even 1% or 2% of your customers who use it in different contexts so for example in alexa devices often people will use a feature at night or when a baby is sleeping in the room and so you have to be cognizant of how much response do i want to add to alexa Should, do i want to expose this through a touch action versus requiring a voice command and so on so it's really important to think through all of the situations that your feature can be accessed in and looking at the ux from that lens the last one which is one of my pet peeves is the error cases so often we design for success and the success flow looks great and folks are happy we make sure it works and we ship it but what really gets us and what really drives customer friction and frustration is the error cases so windows for example has a bad reputation from the past of having the really hard to understand dialog boxes or dialog boxes with only okay there but when you design the error ux you want to make sure that it's clear to the customer what has happened whether they have something that they can do to resolve it or it's just the system and it will fix itself how can they still achieve their goal if there is a way and so on so really focus on the error cases and make sure that it's clear for the customers how to get out of that situation now the next one is user research as a product manager i would highly highly recommend that you get deeply involved with whatever user research team or user researchers you have at your disposal it's sort of a two for one benefit a you understand how user research works and how to get good insights on your product but b it's also a great way to learn the customer hat i myself have been on user research interviews that we have done where we literally walked into customers homes and sat with them for a couple of hours just talking casually and talking deeply about how they use their echo devices what are their pain points how do they use it versus their family members who set it up why does the person who set it up use it differently from other people and so on personally in my last 3 and a half years at alexa that activity is one that i remember most clearly and has been most eye opening in terms of how customers truly use our product and we as sort of the tech forward creators and innovators are often in a bubble and ahead of our time than customers are so it's really important to spend time with customers and participate in as many research activities as you can So when thinking as a user researcher there are a few questions I often think about. When you ask questions in a survey, you should really ask yourself is it fair for me to ask this question to the customer or should I really be asking more basic questions and then answer the harder question myself? Often you'll hear surveys of hey which of these three UI options do you like the best? It's not really fair for them to ask you which option they should go with. instead you would ask which one of these or you would test in fact not even ask you would test which ones of them led to the highest success rate which one of them was most performant which one of them was least confusing and then make the harder decision yourself of which option to go with the second question is about research methods so today there are multiple research methods available at our disposal like deep interviews surveys card sorting usability test etc and it's really important to choose the right method for the insights that you are trying to derive similarly it's important to ask the right questions 
one of my really good friends who is a user researcher taught me that often people ask for how do you feel about this feature or how much do you like this feature on a scale of 1 to 5 but then not really asking the next level which is more specific in terms of how accurate is this feature how reliable is it how easy to use was it how fun was it for you to use and those are the aspects that customers can identify with and then you know what you are trying to optimize for so it's really important to ask the right questions at the right level of detail similarly that flows into the next one of what specific aspects we want to ask about the next two questions are sort of related in validating that your study is sort of pure that you don't have bias in the way that you're asking the question or the way that you're setting up the task that they want to do and that the participants that you're gathering are truly representative of your customers. Sometimes that's hard to do because again, because of confidentiality, you can't go out of the company and into true customers segments, but that is where your judgment comes in. And even within the company, I have found simple tricks to get folks that are less tech forward folks in maybe administrative jobs or HR teams who are not as engineering focused as the team actually building it and getting their opinions versus getting opinions from your leaders or within the tech team. Lastly, I think it's really important to understand that given a data set or given a study, is it meant to be a qualitative analysis or a quantitative one? And this is one of my pet peeves. I have often found folks sort of quoting the data from a study as a percentage or sort of macro answers when the sample set was just eight people or 10 people. So they say, hey, six out of eight people said this was great. That's 75%. But then the 75% gets quoted out of context. So it's really important to keep in mind what the sample set was was it intended to be a qualitative or a quantitative study and so on. So that was a quick overview of the five different hats that I wanted to talk about. Um, similarly, you can think about what are the questions you would ask in the other hats as well. Now to wrap up, let's quickly talk about when do you know to wear which hat and how you learn to wear different hats. So I want to set the expectation right up front that there's no clear answer of when to wear which hat. It's more an art than a science. And it's also highly situation dependent in terms of what stage your product is at, what kind of team composition you have, where are the strengths, where are the weaknesses and so on. There's also a concept of are you engaging with internal stakeholders or are you engaging with external partner teams? And there are different implications of wearing the hats. I would typically recommend being more sort of brave or aggressive in the internal stakeholder meetings where you can make mistakes, you can sort of learn from each other. When you're representing yourself to partner teams or even external stakeholders from the company, you really want to make sure that what you're representing as an engineering view is aligned with what the engineers truly think. Having said that, there are a few sort of observational um, cheat sheet, if you will, that I've made is whenever you're considering trade-offs to make in your MLP or in your feature set, you often need to wear the customer, engineer, as well as the leader hats, because they all have different implications on which trade-offs you will make. The next one is in the concept phase, you definitely want to prioritize the customer hat as well as the user researcher hat to make sure that you have enough data and research to inform all of your decisions that are coming henceforth. In the design phase, obviously, you will also wear the designer hat along with the customer and user researcher. Now, it's really important to spend enough time and go deep in these two phases. There's often pressure to run fast and get into execution. But remember that the cost of any decision that you reverse keeps going up as you go through execution. So you want to make as many mistakes as you can. 
and learn from them and reverse your decisions in the concept or design phase as much as possible before the first line of code gets written. The next one is to make sure you are creating the right mechanisms and team structure to build and launch your feature. Never underestimate the impact of the time or the intentionality that you invest in creating that mechanism or creating that team structure. It pays great dividends as you go through the execution phase. When you're executing, obviously you t think a lot as an engineer to understand how to build it, what to put in code versus what to put in cloud as knobs and so on. Also have to think as a leader to understand where your bottlenecks are or if the original intent of the product is still valid. Then as you get into sort of the closing stages of the execution and you go into beta, you think again as a user researcher, as a customer, and then you also have to think as an engineer to see what you need to change or has beta feedback invalidated some of your engineering assumptions that you put in place at the start. And then the last one is before any critical leadership review, make sure you think about it from all of the different hats because leaders will always, always probe from different angles and expect you to know your product from all the different angles. So especially before like approval meetings or go no go review meetings, it's really important that you as a product manager can represent each aspect of your product equally well. So that was about when to wear each hat. And now let's quickly close with how do you get started or how do you learn to wear these different hats? So I know it may seem daunting that how do you learn all of these different disciplines and equally well, but don't sort of think of being the best engineer, the best user researcher, the best designers. You don't have to be that because you do have functional experts that you can rely on. Your job is to just have a basic understanding and vocabulary in all of these disciplines so you can have a good relationship with your peers, as well as to have enough understanding that you can ask the right questions, challenge them in the right way, or if for some reason one of them isn't around, you can channel them to ask the right questions on their behalf. So a simple method that I have learned over time is the learn try review model. So first you basically pick a diverse set of mentors, one from each discipline that you want to learn. Then you spend enough time with them just one-on-one -on -one, asking them or seeking review on some of your product documents and seeing how they think. Look for patterns for where they ask questions in different meetings and observe how some of the questions are often similar in the higher level abstraction. Then the next step is mental role playing. So when you're reviewing your own documents or PowerPoint decks or even writing them, you read the same content over and over again, but from different points of view. So you read it saying, hey, if I was, you know, Jane, who is my user researcher, how would I read this? If I was Michael, my engineer, how would I read this? And so on. So you sort of role play that way and try to learn different perspectives. And then once you have formed an opinion based on that, you quickly review it with your mentors or peers to make sure that the way you are thinking and the way they are thinking is aligned. And that again goes back into the learn stage where you learn to get better and better over time. So that's really it. And this cycle, although we covered only the five hats today, is equally applicable to learn something like privacy or data analysis where you think you might need to learn that discipline as well. And that brings me to the end of my talk. Thanks a lot. It's been really fun putting this together and I can't wait to hear your feedback. Feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or provide comments in the webinar link as well. Thanks a lot and have a nice day.